Welcome to State of Bay, located in the picturesque Guaracata Plaza. Serving locally sourced cuisine inspired by the flavors of the Riviera. Hello, I'm Twyla Kim. I've been an artist and hairstylist in Santa Barbara for 20 years. I personalize color, design, and precision haircuts for each individual at Sequel Salon in Montecito. I'm happy to be sponsoring Get Conscious Now. Hello. Welcome to Get Conscious Now. I'm Patricia DiOrio and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this new program on Channel 17 TV Santa Barbara. And I'm here today with my wonderful co-host, Stu Zimmerman. Stu, welcome. Thank you, Patricia. So if I were to ask you to give us, in just a few short sentences, what, conscious, what Get Conscious Now is about, what would you say to our audience? I would say that Get Conscious Now is about loving your life to the fullest. That's my interest in this conversation. I just simply want to love my life and I want to feel great in my body and beyond. So wherever I need to get conscious and do it now so I can love my life more and have the, you know, the blessing of just being created, that's what I'm here for and I just feel blessed to be in this conversation with you and everybody watching right now. Great. Perfect. Get Conscious Now um, is about exploring the shifting paradigms that are happening in all aspects of life. What does it mean to be conscious in business? What does it mean to be conscious in medicine? What does it mean to be conscious in education? And tonight, we're going to be looking at what it means to be conscious in the whole economic conversation. So we're going to look at conscious economy tonight. And our guest is Eileen Workman, who is an expert in this particular area. She is the author of a wonderful book called Sacred Economics, The Currency of Life, a revealing look at the erosion of capitalism and a reimagining of the nature of genuine wealth. She has a very fascinating story to share with us tonight, but I'm just going to give you a short little tidbit to say that she was involved in the financial industry in Wall Street for 16 years. And then she rather abruptly left, and her life transformed. She transformed her life. And she's here tonight to tell us about her story and uh, her new focus on what it is to have a new economic structure. Eileen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having really me. Really delighted to have you here tonight. It's wonderful to be here. Great. Yes, Eileen, it is a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about your journey from being in Wall Street to going and going beyond Wall Street to writing a book about sacred economics. Mm. I could go into a really deep story around that, and it's a very interesting and complex story, but the net of it really is, is that as I was experiencing my life as a Wall Street executive, essentially, and making all kinds of money and living the successful high life that I had been trained to believe was the truth of what we're here to do, I felt empty. And I got lost in it. And there was a sadness to me that I wasn't in touch with the truth of my being. And I hit a point where I couldn't do it anymore. And I had to stop in order to try to figure out what the truth is. Why are we here? What's it all mean? What's it about? And as I did that, it was, as you said in, in your opening, it was about love. And it was about how to connect with each other in the deeper way of what it means to be alive. And as part of that is, what are we doing? What are we doing with all these things we're making and building and creating? And is that serving life? So those questions were the things I needed to explore. Mm -hmm. So what was the event, or what was your inspiration, if you will, to make that shift from uh, a very lucrative career on Wall Street mm. to um, living in love all the time? Mm. I had what I would call a spiritual emergency, that I hit the wall with my practice of being a stockbroker, and I recognized somehow deep in my, my soul that 
my soul was going to die if I continued doing what I was going to do. And intellectually, it made sense for me to continue the work and do the work. And my mind tried to rationalize why I should stay in the job and all the responsibilities I had. And my heart kept saying, no, you cannot do this. So they went to war. And my body was the battlefield upon which they fought. And the choice was to either allow my soul to die or to bring it forward. And my heart won the war. And my mind cracked. I went through what the, the medical community labeled as psychosis, which was what it took for me to shed all of the conditioning and the beliefs and the clinging to the assumption that I had to continue. And when I finished, I was somewhat battered, but I was still here. And I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I would rather eat out of dumpsters and be homeless than live a life of luxury that has no, no bottom to it, no mm -hmm. truth. So here I am. Were you at all in um, a consciousness conversation? By that I mean, were you part of like the spiritual community that we hear about today and this idea of quantum physics and spirituality? I mean, were mm -hmm. you in that conversation at all or was this simply a, something that just came up organically for you? Oh, no, I had been searching. I mean, I was a dabbler. I had studied. You know, I grew up Catholic, so I'd you know, grown up in the Christian faith, which didn't satisfy me. I explored Wicca, I explored shamanism, I used plant medicines, I studied physics. I mean, I went everywhere I could wow. possibly go for answers but inside myself. And when I had finally looked everywhere else and I didn't have the answer, that's when I stopped and I said, I've got to go in. I've got to turn around and look and see what's here. What's the truth of me? And then how do I bring that forward in a life-affirming way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you went about your... Uh inward journey mm -hmm. and your transformation, mm -hmm. you came to new understandings about wealth and money. Yes. Can you share with us exactly what you've learned and how you've kind of redefined them? Yeah, I feel a little bit like a Manchurian candidate sometimes. Like I spent 16 years in that business and when the bell rang, suddenly it was time for me to turn on it and, and reveal the truth of it. And what I had come to understand was that money is not real. It's something that we created and gave power to. And we have, as, as a species, elevated it to the status of the most important thing that we do. And the truth is, we're living beings. We're biological creatures in a biological world. And the real resources that we play with, the ecosystems that we dance in, the relationships we build with one another, that's the real wealth of who and what we are, the creative capacity of human beings, the potential, the magnificent potential of a species. That's the real wealth. And here we are making jobs to make money rather than making love with reality. And it's unfortunate. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is call attention to that and say, hey, can we change that? Because nobody's really happy. Mm -hmm. Right. The psychosis, if this you will, <laughs> is, is trying to fill up something on the inside yes. with something on the outside yes. because mm -hmm. you're never going to fill it right. that way, but yet people will continue to try. Mm -hmm. And you're already full. One of the things I, I always say is um, the way out is in, mm. that success is an inside job. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in your book, you do quite a, a dissertation uh, on capitalism being now obsolete. Yes. Would you share a little bit with us about what you mean by that? Well. I, you know, if you look at the history of capitalism and how it's emerged over literally thousands of years, it was great for an adolescent species. Go back five, ten thousand years, and we had no tools, we had very little understanding of the world. There were only a couple of million people on the planet, and it was a wild, incredible wilderness filled with vast resources. And our mission was to populate it, explore it, figure out what we could do and grow rapidly, just like a teenager. Mm -hmm. And we did it beautifully. We did it beautifully. And here we are 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years later, and it's time to move into adulthood. So the things that we used to do no longer serve us. Just like a teenager eating 12 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you're going to get fat as an adult. You're going to develop morbid obesity. So how do we make that shift? Mm -hmm. That's the question that well, I explore. Isn't it also true, I mean, you take a look at capitalism, what we have today, which people call capitalism, really isn't. Just simply by virtue of all the rules and regulations that may benefit certain industries at certain times because they want to protect their wealth, which may be capitalism on one level is protecting your own wealth and everyone for themselves on some level. But yet, how do you, how are we, let's just define our terms. How are you defining capitalism 
and you know, as it exists today? Well, I think if you really look at what capitalism was supposed to be, it was supposed to be a mechanistic system whereby the direction of money, money would flow to those things that we wanted to create for ourselves. So the capital would move toward the businesses and the services that humanity wanted, fund those businesses to make them successful, and the investors would receive a profit because those, those products would be sold to the public and the public would be happy to have them. And when we started out, that was true. But what ends up happening as you move through the industrial world and the post-industrial world is the, the notion that people are working for the system and within the system shifted because when you had an industrial world, suddenly machines began replacing blue-collar jobs physical labor in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And as we've moved into an, uh, a technological society, computers are replacing the mental aspect of human work in the workforce. So the machines are doing all the work. Mm -hmm. There's no need for as much human work as there used to be, so the formula's broken down. Mm -hmm. And now people are desperate to try to figure out how to get money, and the money is flowing into the systems that just make more money. They're not worried mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. about what really benefits people. Mm -hmm. So it's lost its foundation, its footing. Uh, I had the opportunity to read something John Mackey mm. wrote, and he advocates conscious capitalism, which yes. is a term we don't normally hear. Mm -hmm. you know, That's the CEO capitalism. for Whole Foods, right? As the CEO, mm -hmm. thank you, right. Stu, as the CEO for Whole Foods. And uh, what he says, uh, how he defines conscious capitalism is that it's, it's not the old capitalism that's pretty much based on greed and the bottom line being money. And it's not the other end of the spectrum, which is the whole nonprofit world of martyring and struggling to raise money and, and like that. Uh, it's really about making money and making a difference. So it's mm -hmm. a win-win. It's a balance between the two. What, could you comment on that? I wish that were my position because it would be a lot easier to hold than my position. <laughs> but. My biggest issue, really, is that the whole monetary system is obsolete and problematic. And because that's the foundational element of capitalism, until we fix the monetary system, there's no way we're going to be able to fix the capitalistic structure because money itself is, is not functional. It's non-functional. It's, it's actually so, diseased. Can you, so can you be specific here when you're talking mm -hmm. about the monetary system is yes. broken? Yes, absolutely. What, what, what are you, exactly are you referring to? Well, the fact that we have a debt-based system, first of all, that, that what we're capitalizing is, is basically the things that we think need to be produced, but that's not necessarily what we want to be capitalizing. And the money itself as debt-based instrument means it has to be borrowed in order to come into existence. So it creates this whole oblig obligatory system where people owe each other all the time. And in a lot of ways, it's like asking people to dig a pit get down into it, fill the pit back up from six feet under, and then they get to start at the ground and begin their life cycle. And I'm saying, why do we have to dig the pit? Why don't we just create the capital and capitalize those things that we value, which we could do very readily. We don't have to have a borrowing debt-based system. Hmm. So that's what I'm looking at. So what is this new system that you proposed? I, I understand from our conversation this week that mm. you've written a 60-page white paper. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to be the foundation for your next book, I would assume. I'm not sure if it'll be another book, book? but it's certainly going to come out as a paper, as a separate financial offering. Well, for share, a new system. share with us your vision for this new economy. Well, the way that I'm looking at it is how, you know, again, how can we restructure the process so that we don't have debt and that money isn't always flowing in the wrong direction, which is where it seems to be now. There's this hyper-concentration of wealth. And I want to see money be perceived as the bloodstream of the society. If we look at society and say, it's a, it's a body. It's a human body writ large upon the landscape. And currency, the current, is how we move the goods and services between ourselves. So the more current we have in flow and the more less blockage we have, the more fluidity we have, the easier it is for us to relate to one another. So what are we going to capitalize? What are the things we value? We value natural resources. We value beauty. We value creative capacity. We value human health and well-being. We value our healthy ecosystems. So all of those things have a tangible value to us. If we put a monetary value on that and said, this is the worth of this nation or this world, this is what it's worth, and then we distributed that and said, how do we want to spend that? How do we want to invest that? 
and we distributed it on a community basis where every person had a share in the wealth of the world, including their own potential, including the potential of all others. And we had the opportunity then to direct that money toward those things that we valued. We could grow that national wealth or global wealth in a way that enhances the value of the things that we do value. So we could build infrastructure because that's important. We could clean up pollution because that's important. And that would create more money for the system to be distributed as a national dividend. Mm -hmm. And all the people would get the dividend every year. So now, instead of me competing with you so that I get a better education and can make more money, where I would prefer to see you fail so I can win, I'm looking at this and saying, how do I make Patricia happier? How do I make Stu happier? Because that's going to raise the National Wealth Index. How can I serve you? And the interesting part of that is as you begin to serve others, the intrinsic joy of being in service to life mm -hmm. is so naturally life-affirming that I believe we can get to a place where we can just throw the money away. It's almost like training wheels. And we won't need it anymore. We'll just all be serving each other and creating in a loving and life-affirming way. So that really does require, <laughs> in my humble opinion, a, a significant shift in consciousness. Yes. Where yes. people go from a, uh, a paradigm of separation. And we've talked mm -hmm. about this in my senses. This will be an ongoing conversation, will it not, uh, mm -hmm. Patricia, just in terms of going beyond the illusion of separation, mm -hmm. which ultimately is what we need to get conscious about, is the ultimate reality of things are, is that we are interconnected, mm -hmm. that we are an aspect of something greater than all of us, potentially. And mm -hmm. so how can we uh, you know, all share the bounty of this planet and this lifetime together with all sharing the resources? Mm -hmm. So and it is about then serving each other rather than competing with each other or taking from one another in some uh, illusion of a fixed pie. Yes. I would say that one of the challenges is that for many years, hundreds of years now, we've been talking about the universe as a machine, as a mechanical system. And when you have a machine, you take part A, part B, part C, part D, you put them all together, and what comes out is a simple sum of its parts. And so we've perceived the world that way, and we've perceived ourselves that way, and our systems are built around that mechanical structure. Biology is very different because mm -hmm. biology, the fundamental principle of biology is that the whole is always greater than the simple mm -hmm. sum of its parts would indicate. Mm -hmm. So what's the greatness that we're creating by coming together? We have to have a reason to unite consciously as an interconnected species or we'll come apart. Mm -hmm. Just being a machine won't do it because if I can be the same thing on my own as I can be with plus one and plus two, where's the benefit for me to become a plus one and a plus two? However, if there's something grander happening on a deeper level that invites me to want to be part of that magnificence, then I can join freely and consciously and become a multicellular organism, mm -hmm. which is what I think humanity is attempting to do. Mm -hmm. The first conscious species to become a multicellular organism. And so we're the only species that can be self-aware on yes. the planet. You know, so. so in a sense, if you look at how evolution worked, where, where cells came together to become cooperative multicellular organisms, we're being asked as multicellular organisms who are self-aware to come together and become a conscious meta-organism and build a system mm -hmm. in which we can biologically and organically play together mm -hmm. that's bigger than any of us could be on our own or even just our sum would be. So are you, are you saying that, are you suggesting that there wouldn't actually be a form of, of currency, there wouldn't be a, an exchange of, what would the exchange of look like? I, you know, I hate to predict mm -hmm. because I think consciousness is an organic process and it's always surprising. So what it's going to do versus what I think it might do may be two entirely different things. But I do believe it's possible, as people drop more deeply into the truth of the interconnectivity of all things, mm -hmm. for us to just give our gifts from that place of love and joy. And what's the profit to me when I give my gift, when I write my book and put it out in the world? I don't care if money comes back. I want people to read the book. And the joy for me is knowing that it was delivered through me. I'm a conduit for this information. And if it changes somebody's life for the better, how magnificent, mm -hmm. how magnificent that is. 
I don't need capital to come in other than the fact that the system says I'm supposed to have it in order to be able to pay my bills and eat tomorrow. If that all went away, would I still write? Oh my God, yes. I'm so passionate about what I do and I love what I do and I love sharing with people. I guess what I'm not clear on is you know, how we would, on a very practical level, mm -hmm. take care of paying our bills and paying the rent and you know, doing what we need to do to take care of ourselves in this world. That's a beautiful question. And I've, I've pondered it for a while. What comes to me is that in our, I always look at the, the body as a map. This is the blueprint, and, and reality is a blueprint. So what, what's it doing? And it's created an autonomic nervous system. You don't say to yourself every morning, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Mm -hmm. And that freedom not to have to think about that enables your consciousness to do more powerful and special and beautiful things. If we created an organic society where everybody's basic needs were just met, here's your house, if you need clothes, go get them, if you need food, go feed yourself, here's the water, then we're no longer spending 80, 90% of our time paying bills, worrying about where these things are coming from, how we're doing it. Just imagine the things that our human consciousness collectively could do if we built an autonomic nervous system into this society. But the fear, which I think is an unfounded fear, is that if we don't make people work for a living, they won't do anything. And I think that's absurd if you look at your own house. You're working in your house all the time. No one's writing you a monthly check to be in your home, take care of your family, mm -hmm. feed your pets. You do it from love. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I found very fascinating uh, after 2008 when everything kind of crashed and burned, that people that were all of a sudden out of a job after mm -hmm. working, you know, nine to five for so many years, uh, it, it was a shock to their system. But what, in, in information that I read, they started doing things like going to painting classes and yoga classes mm -hmm. and uh, taking care, better care of their bodies and going to cooking, cooking classes and doing the things that they never really had time to do because they were always nose to the grindstone, nine to five, making the money. So I thought that was very interesting. And I remember um, also hearing that it was during this time of an economic downturn that so many entrepreneurs would, be, would come forth. You know, because they would be given an opportunity to let go of, you know, the trappings of what they think they're supposed to do and really listen to their hearts as to really what they want to do. There's probably very few people, relatively speaking, when you look at all the people on the planet that are doing their heart's desires, that are living their heart's desires, that are living their purpose and get up every day and inspired and can't wait to continue to do what they're doing. You know, so in a way, I think that what has occurred, and even though we're, you know, we're in this position of coming you know, into an upturn, I understand, um, that this has been a very powerful opportunity for people to get in touch with their desires and what they truly want to do. And in many ways, it's a jobless upturn. So the flip side, the, the positive side of there not being jobs is people have more time. Yeah. And I've always said that if necessity is yeah. the mother of invention, father is the time of in, or the, or the invention. Time is the father of invention. And that's a deep truth, because if you don't have the time to contemplate mm -hmm. how to invent, how to create, what to do next, then you're stuck in the need. So by gifting ourselves more time to do the deep contemplative work and look at the systems and say, how do we up-level the systems to really mirror the truth of what we're understanding ourselves to be becoming, then we can't get it done. But we can, in fact, do it if we have the time. So I think... The cosmos is giving us the time, whether we're kicking and screaming into it or not. It's coming. We're getting time to do these things. Yeah, disintegration before reintegration. <laughs> so, so wouldn't a great first step, just like you've been on your journey, mm -hmm. and your journey has been one of, you know, kind of a, a radical, uh, you know, a dismantling mm -hmm. of a worldview. Yes. Right? In favor mm -hmm. of what you have come to learn in your heart to know to be true. Mm-hmm in terms of the bottom line being love and joy. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately is something that can't be bought. <laughs> it's beyond money. Is that something you would recommend uh, to our viewers and everybody as, you know, um, it may, it's still gonna take more than a village to recreate a system. Yes. <laughs> with so many different integrated working pieces and parts together. But the first thing we can do to explore working together to create a new system, wouldn't it be to, uh, to invest our time in our own conscious awakening. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I hear all the time, well, I would love to do that, but I have bills to pay and I have to go to work and all the concerns that people have mm -hmm. that are rationalizations in many ways mm -hmm. about why they don't have time to become more conscious and really go inside themselves. And the truth is it only takes a moment. It takes this moment, this now by grace saying, this is it. Nothing else is going to get in the way of me looking deeply into myself and discovering the truth of myself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to spend five years contemplating your navel in a cave. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that long mm -hmm. to really find the truth. You know, um, I conduct circles for men and women that are really interested in, in employing the spiritual principles grounded in quantum physics to know that it's just common sense. Mm -hmm. And when we, in month three, we do money. And uh, one of the questions that we begin that month with is if, well, first of all, how do you define success? Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting to see people's different opinions about that. And then the other question, which always fascinates me, is um, if money were no object, what would, you, what would your life look like? Mm -hmm. you know, would you still work? Or would you, would you not? You know, it, it, and most, I would say that looking at all the people that have gone through circle at this point in time, I would say that the majority of them would not be doing what they were doing, but they would work, but they, exactly. would, do, they would do something that lit them up, that they loved, that they were excited about. You know, they wouldn't, it, it wasn't about just spending time vacationing all the time or um, you know, not just hanging out, but it would be, they would be very proactive in finding something that would light them up to do. I've and done that exercise. Interestingly enough, it doesn't matter what group you do that exercise with, we used to do it in the stockbroker business. Huh. So we would have meetings of stockbrokers, people whose whole goal is to make lots of money. And the question was, if you won the lotto tomorrow, what would you do? And the first thing is, I'd buy myself a new car or I'd buy a house. People have those pent up needs for material things, or they yeah. want to buy their family things. Mm -hmm. But once they get that done, which doesn't take very long, suddenly there's that kind of deep, thoughtful now process what? of, <laughs> then I want to find a cure for cancer. Or I want to go help all the children, the needy children. Or I want to clean up the rivers. So the, the deeper work that we need to do is lying there right on the surface for all the doing. And all the people know what their heart's passion is. But what's blocking them from accomplishing it is the need to pay the bills. And we've mm -hmm. built that system. That's not natural. That's our imposition on nature. We can take it off. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more than that. It starts with, you know, it's like one of those Maslow <laughs> yes, pyramids exactly. where it starts exactly. with, you know what, I need to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. I need to get my survival needs met. Mm -hmm. But then it's like this thing of, I need to feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. I need to show myself as being worthy. So that's why I need to have the car. Mm -hmm. and that's why I need to have the house so that people can respect me. And better yet, I get to even respect myself and feel good about myself. And then once I get to that, well, then maybe I can get around to some form of uh, you know, self-actualization, as Maslow would have called it, where it's really more about living a life of altruism, mm -hmm. living a life of giving back. But it goes through these stages. And I really wonder if we really need to go through that process anymore. Um. The interesting part for me is that I think what we're coming to as a species, because we are hitting the wall in a lot of the natural resources mm -hmm. and some of the mess we're making, and there's a lot of stress and unhappiness, I think what we're going to do is build Maslow's Pyramid. And we're going to do it one layer at a time. We're going to create a structure where all those basic needs are met. And then the challenge becomes, how do we do the second part? How do I feel good? Or how do I get mm -hmm. safe? Or all those things. So we're going to have to look at war and peace. And then we, as we layer that in to where that's automatic, we're going to keep going up. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate process, I think, for the, the apex of human consciousness is to get to the place where everybody born, their only mission is to self-actualize. All the other stuff is built, it's baked into the cake already. So we're still very early as a species. We're young. Well, you know, it, it's true, and you were talking about us as a what, teenage species and mm -hmm. everything. that, And we're, you know, I think that this is the work of... Um, his name, um, his name is escaping me, but I'll think of it in a moment. Anyway, this particular uh, scientist and author who says that if you were to look at where humanity is now from the standpoint of you know, whether we're babies or children mm -hmm. or adolescents or young adults, and I heard him speak years ago here in Santa Barbara, uh, he said we were definitely teenagers. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole war, my gun is bigger than your gun, and, and that whole comparison comp competition uh, conversation. 
Um, but I heard him speak recently, and uh, he says that we're now into young adulthood as a species. Mm -hmm. We're finally maturing. And it's interesting that us baby boomers are the ones that are kind of riding the wave into that whole new way of being. Mm -hmm. Because we baby boomers, don't, we, don't wanna be, we don't wanna be changing and going through the aging process, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we know that there's so much more to this evolutionary process than what we've been taught and how we've been plugged into um, these programs that, that just don't serve us. Right. Yeah. Well, part of the challenge, too, is that it's not, we don't all age at the same time. So what's happening? I think young women tend to mature more rapidly than young men, and it's a male-dominated patriarchal society right now. So the women are leading the edge of that maturation process. And there's quite a few men that are moving into that direction, but they're still the, the power-dominator structure is run by the adolescent male mentality, mm -hmm. with a few exceptions. Mm -hmm. So as that shifts over time, I think we're going to see a natural progression in the way that we're relating to one another. More, rather than disaffected teenager from the you know parent, we have two kinds of parents. We have either the helicopter mommy, which is the Democratic Party, or we have the stern, scolding daddy who's going to make you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And we're these children, you know, rebellious teens. Mm -hmm. We're going to become lovers because that's the true intimacy of adulthood. How do we become lovers with one another? How do we become lovers with the world? How do we put ourselves on an equal footing so that I'm good enough now and I have enough trust in my own capacity? Mm. And I think that's where the species is going. Well, one of the things I'm observing, uh, one of the things I'm observing in this is that women are starting to integrate a little bit more of the, the masculine yes. uh, proactivity, taking the action steps, and being a little more assertive uh, mm -hmm. in what they know in their hearts to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, women typically are known to be more than nurturers, a little bit more compassionate, <laughs> a little bit more, dare I say, loving mm -hmm. than men. It's true. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no competition here. <laughs> and, and for men, it's the opportunity for them to start to embrace a little more of, of the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and really come into your heart and, and realize that we are here. I mean, we do that with our children, at least some of us guys do, don't we? Uh, to, to really, to, to love them and to nurture them and, and to start to care more for employees or whatever it is and, and start to open the heart more that way. And so I'm seeing that in a way, it's really about all of us, whether it's, you know, a, you know the yin-yang, if you will, mm -hmm. starting to becoming one whole uh, within each of us. Yes. It's interesting because as I'm marketing my circle to men, it's a lot more challenging than marketing the circle to women mm -hmm. because men think of a circle and they immediately think it's going to be this woo-woo <laughs> goddessy or whatever their images are of it. But actually, it's, I'm marketing to men that are really ready to connect their head and their hearts mm -hmm. and really embrace the divine feminine within them, like introduce that and bring that, that Tao together, the male and female, so that we women are balanced with our male and female, and the men are, and then we can really rock and roll as we move forward. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, you know, the show is about consciousness, and consciousness, the way I've defined it uh, for this program, is that people are awake and aware uh, to this truth, according to quantum physics, that we're just energy beings and we're having this human experience, and that we have this innate and measurable power through our thoughts and intentions when we're focusing on what we want to create it. And uh, it would seem to me that that conversation, that that, that mm, foundation would need to be present before we would be able to see some type, some, uh, an economic shift like this. I question all the time what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Mm -hmm. You know, some people have said that the, the chicken is the egg's way of reproducing itself. <laughs> There's a little bit of truth in that. I don't know if the individuals need to shift before the system shifts. It seems to me it's a dance, mm -hmm. that as more and more people shift, the systems that we create naturally mirror the truth of us. And as they more naturally mirror the truth of us, it becomes easier for people to shift. So, I, you know, it's like a rainbow. Where does red end and, and yellow begin? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it, it feels organically like it's happening all the time. 
And uh, you know, my personal my personal uh, stand on that is that it's really got to begin with within each of us. You know, when we can really when we re really can come into alignment with our true nature and who we truly are and our power, then we start connecting with other people, and and then we 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 build that resonant field that keeps growing and growing and growing and growing until we have that whole synergistic the whole is greater than the sum of its parts effect. Mm -hmm. As we evolve, mm -hmm. so I mean that's my personal. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah. But, but I do think there will come a time when the children being born don't have to go through that oh, transformation. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They'll Isn't be born naturally into yeah. that space. Yeah. Agreed. So it's almost like the, you know the metamorphosis, mm -hmm. and it does seem like science has a particular pattern mm -hmm. of growth. And it does start with one cell that vibrates at a certain frequency, then it starts attracting other cells, and it begins to cluster. It typically, you know, like, like when the uh, caterpillar turns into a butterfly, the imaginal cells of the butterfly are actually at first getting a little bit attacked by the caterpillar, like, what's going on here? You know, and, and yet the, the vibration of these uh, soon to be butterfly, cell, the butterfly cells continue to cluster, and then it's like the caterpillar says, ah, well, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> and then the critical mass takes over. And, Cancer and virus, it all kinds of works in that same way. It starts with a cell and it begins with a cluster and grows from there. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder whether consciousness and raising our, our frequency, if you want to call it that, to be more loving or joyful or connected with each other uh, can literally work the same way. I think on a personal level that's all we can do. Because you can't make anybody else change their mind. I've no. tried. It, it's not effective. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then the system shows up actually to support. Yes. The new energy. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's what I find is that as, as I shift within myself to just relax and allow the truth to present itself to me rather than go get it or try to make somebody else figure it out, then it just manifests beautifully with ease and grace. And it's lovely. It's lovely. Yeah, it's called evolution. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we talk a little bit more about you know, both the bottom line of happiness and, uh, and your no notion of sh uh, sharing mm. uh, versus selling. Yeah, mm -hmm. I found that an interesting discussion in your book. Yeah, I, you know, to me, one of the grave disservices we do each other, if you really look at how the system is structured, we're profiting off the neediness of other people. If we have a child who needs an education in order to serve the society, we make them pay to get the information that they need so they can become a productive member of the society that we're part of. There's no other species in the world that makes its young pay to get the information it needs to be efficient and effective at being an adult. Mm -hmm. So there's something fundamentally wrong with that strategy. And if we shift that and say, how do we instead say to these young people, welcome. Welcome to the world, baby child. What do you need to manifest the most magnificent thing in yourself, and how can we help you? And we give that to every child on this planet out of love and joy and anticipation of what's going to unfold. Wouldn't they love that system and be, hey, thanks, what can I give back? Because I don't have any needs anymore. I'm not suffering. I'm not struggling. Mm -hmm. I'm in joy because my system has held me and supported me, and everyone's waiting to see what I have to deliver like a flower. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the way that I've shifted my own reality and I've started to live my life is I don't give things with any expectation of return. I never put parameters on the things I give people. I have people ask me for money or donations all the time and I say, here, and they say, well, here's what I'm going to, I don't care what you're going to do with it. Do with it what you will, what brings you joy, and that will surprise me more than what I think you should do with it. Mm -hmm. I trust you and I trust the process of just giving with no strings attached, because that's how nature works. What, where do you see the barter system fitting in, if it does? I think it's a regression, and I'm never comfortable with evolutionary regression. We had barter, and we left it behind because it was too problematic. As we got more creative, and as we had more people making more things and sharing them over longer distances, it's, it's impossible for me to take my corn and try to trade it for your dresser when you need pigs. It's, so we made money as a placeholder so that we could try to compare and contrast our completely unique and desperate gifts. How do I compare a pig to a dresser? If you're hungry, you need the pig. If I need to feed my pig, I need wheat. You know. So how do we make these things on parity and say it's worth X, Y, or Z? 
That's a mechanistic system that denies the life force of what's going on in these transactions. I say throw all that away. It's pointless, and it's making it hard for us because we're trying to measure rather than simply observe the response of reality when we do these exchanges. So barter is, is problematic. Hmm. Okay. Well, my, my, my sense is, is that uh, you know, whatever system, uh, the system that you're describing, which mm -hmm. is such a, uh, a radical departure yeah. from where we are right now. I'm nothing if not radical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of people fun. holding on with white knuckles, <laughs> <laughs> and you may be out there one of them. <laughs> What do you suggest, at least for right now, mm -hmm. that people can do, take a very uh, practical mm -hmm. step in their own lives to, uh, you know, to, to move in this direction? A couple of things. I would start by saying don't take money so seriously. <laughs> we've been taught to do that and we've been taught to make it the absolute pinnacle of what it is we're achieving. And my position is let's, let's move beyond that and start looking at what we're doing with it. Dive deeper underneath the notion of just getting money and say, what do I want it for? Mm -hmm. And how do I do those things? The second part is practice gifting without strings. Practice playing with people and say, what do you need? How can I help? And experiment with it and see what happens when you give people things and don't have expectations in return. One of the beautiful things is once you let go of your expectations, what you find is you're not, not internally suffering anymore because they didn't live up to them. So you got mm -hmm. a lot of free time now and happy energy that you can do other things with. So it's, it's a really interesting to play games with yourself and, and just try different experiments on what works and what doesn't. Don't get locked in the existing paradigm. Mm -hmm. So along with not taking money so seriously, mm -hmm. Maybe we can start by not taking ourselves so seriously, yes. Yes, <laughs> because you know, let, let's face it. You know, if we are in fact, and uh, you know, we had a great discussion on our last show. And if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. And you'll find us. Please watch it, uh, because we discussed about everything being energy, including mm -hmm. us being energy beings. And if we literally are these optical illusions of being separate, mm -hmm. then and we really are ultimately connected to something that is infinite and through the fabric of all creation, then really maybe we don't have the need to take our qu ourselves quite so seriously. You know, we get to lighten up a little bit here and just really enjoy the fact that we, any of us exist at all. I, I think the most potent realization I've had in my lifetime, and I've lived a relatively decently long life, <laughs> is, is that all fear it really comes down to fear of death. We're terrified of dying, and we do everything we can to stay alive. And this notion that the form, I have to preserve and protect my form and my family's form and, the, and you know the, the surroundings I'm in, if you really stop and breathe into that, it's not the truth. The form is temporary. The form is always temporary. So it's a fool's game to try to save the form. When you let go of that and say, you know what, the form's going to dissolve. So. Preserving the form at any cost is fruitless. Preserve the form at a reasonable cost, but the deeper reason to be in form is to express creatively mm -hmm. the love and the joy and, and to experience the beauty of reality. And if I have to surrender that in order to stay physically safe, mm -hmm. I'd rather check out. Mm -hmm. I'd rather check out. I think that the, uh, again, this is my own personal feeling, but more than people being afraid of death, and I know they say you know people are afraid of death and public speaking; those are the two things. <laughs> I think that I think the fear, I think the primary fear uh, uh, of, for humanity, based on everything that I've studied and learned in my own sense and my own experience, is uh, fear of separation. Uh. Fear that we are separate from source, that we're separate from each other, and other people may be connected, but I'm the one that's not connected. And I think from that comes the unworthiness and not good enough and all the programs that we inadvertently get plugged into on some level, you know, even if we're raised with money. You know, money seems to be like the God where every, everyone's focused on money being success and, and all. And I, I, I've never really had that, um, you know, that perception. And, uh, it, and in, in a way, that having the perception of um, Letting my love of what I want to do guide me has really been more valuable to me than having a great deal of money. You said it better than I did. And, and what I would add to that little piece is that 
the, the deep understanding that I've come to is the separation, is the separation of there being a sense of self that is separate from life. We're taught, I have a life I can lose. Well, what is it that's losing the life? It's life mm -hmm. itself. You can't mm -hmm. lose what you are. Mm -hmm. So it's an absurd perspective, mm -hmm. but that's the way we're raised, is to believe that we can be separated from life. Birth and death are opposites. One's a doorway you come in, one's a doorway you go out. But what's doing the, the flow is life itself. Mm -hmm. So wherever you go, there you are. You're not going to lose life because that's the essential truth of what you are. Mm -hmm. To me, that's God. That's, that's the force that manifests itself throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are, mm -hmm. moving through this form. You, you know, that also can even apply to the title of this program, Get Conscious Now. Uh, there's nothing to get <laughs> outside of yourself. You know, there's no there, there. So uh, to that extent, it really is about uh, inquiring within. And luckily, gratefully, we have people who, ha you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, all kinds of people who have been through uh, all kinds of uh, pathways of enlightenment from Jesus and Buddha, all, the Dalai Lama, all kinds of teachers, as well as science that is showing us that we're all interconnected as energy waves and vibrating frequencies and everything, that we have all of these guidelines to uh, uh, not to have to acquire anything really outside of ourselves right now. We have all the tools and everything ready and available to us right now to, uh, to expand, which is, I find particularly exciting. So we're coming to the end of our interview. This has been really a wonderful conversation. And I, I'd like to ask you, the last question being, if you had a pearl of wisdom to share with our audience, something that would kind of sum up our conversation today, and also you know, your contribution that you're making to humanity, what would that be? I think the, the, I feel the deepest truth that I have to offer is that as an interconnected living being, what I have come to know in my heart is anything I do to elevate or support any aspect of the totality elevates and enriches me. And anything I do to diminish any aspect of the totality, any other being, diminishes me. And if I function that way on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm in joy. When I forget that is when I get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we forget who we are. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, Eileen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Eileen. It's been really wonderful to have you as our second guest. Really <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and uh, we're, we invite you to stay with us for the remainder of the show. Mm, and you. I think you'll enjoy it. So now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm happy to introduce my co-host here, Stu Zimmerman. And his segment is called Stu's Views. Sir? Oh, thank you so much, Patricia. I'll <laughs> take it away. Yeah, so uh, here's the view from Stu for today in this moment, okay? Let's focus again on money here for a moment and consider that money is energy. In fact, that is why it's called a currency, okay? Now, what kind of energy exactly is money? Well, I'm offering you to consider that it's a lot like water. In fact, if you take a look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the lexicon and the jargon around money, what do you find? You find cash flows, you find pools of income, streams, yeah, streams of income, pools of capital. You find liquidity. Cash is literally considered and called a liquid asset. Okay, so now let's, if we can learn more about money for a moment, why don't we take a look at water? And uh, one thing about water is, in case you haven't noticed, when you look in a pool of it, you see your reflection. And frankly, it's a little bit distorted frequently. If you take a look at yourself and your beliefs around money, if you happen to be, dare I say, insecure or having trust issues, if you have a lot of money, you're really insecure <laughs> and you really have trust issues. You know, conversely, if you feel like you're really of a, a generosity of spirit and that you have a lot to offer and offer the world and that you want to serve, you got a lot of money, a lot of philanthropy. You could seed all kinds of projects for and not for profit that can really make a difference in this world. How else are, are money and, uh, and water similar? Well, have you noticed when water stands still what happens to it after a period of time? 
gets really funky. <laughs> it's kind of disgusting. Then it starts to get all these growths and stuff in it and ultimately gets polluted. Well, money on the sidelines, just sitting there either out of fear or out of savings or out of hoarding or something like that, you know, kind of festers a little bit itself. And it doesn't do the job it can do. You know, again, if water is moving and very much channeled in a specific direction, it has great force, great energy, and great power to uh, accomplish all kinds of things. Similarly, we put our money in a certain direction, dare I say, one that involves something that is, is loving, starting with ourselves, so we can really get to nurture ourselves, take care of ourselves, uh, and others, the people we love, and ultimately the society at large, we can do great good. So I'm really gonna invite you to take a look at your relationship to money and begin to steer it a little bit, starting with how can I nurture myself a little bit more? How can I take my money and time, which we talked about, look at all of our resources. We've got more than just money going along here. We have our time, we have our energy, we have our spheres of influence. We have all kinds of assets we sometimes overlook. But take our money and start to allocate a little bit more in our well-being and literally invest in our consciousness. So uh, I'm inviting you to take stock of your life. In fact, consider yourself to be a stock. And what do we want to do? We want to create a bull market. Now a bull market in the stock market is a series of higher highs and higher lows. And that's where all the mojo is made. That's where all the wealth is really created is in these bull markets. And even when wealth is being created, you still have down days. So you still have lows. And the idea is to go in this sawtooth thing where you know we're going to have lows from time to time, but they don't need to be so pronounced, so deep, or so long-lasting as they had in the past. So these, and these lows typically have beliefs like, I'm not good enough, I'm not smartable enough, I'm not lovable enough, I don't have a, a long enough uh, uh, resume. Uh, you know, all these different things that we somehow self-deprecate. And instead, as we start to invest in our consciousness and invest in ourselves with time and money to really expand and open our hearts and minds to new possibilities, we literally start to have higher highs where we start to get into these exalted states of joy, of love, of appreciation, of connection for others. And as Eileen mentioned, not even needing anything in return because it feels so delightful simply to express. <laughs> and you're laughing at me so many times. Like, <laughs> okay. We also happen to have even more. Okay. That was Stu's views. Now we go to the double Q, which would be quantum quotes, quantum quotes. where Patricia gets to share the wisdom of somebody else and share her own. Patricia? Through the vision, through the lens of my own wisdom, right? Exactly. And your pearls of wisdom. And that my you're pearls wearing. of wisdom that I'm wearing, exactly, 100%. I, I, I've just, since I've been involved with um, uh, doing the spiritual work as, as a counselor and uh, an intuitive, I've been very fascinated with the whole quantum physics conversation. And uh, I, I've understood that, I understand that we need to have a left brain, logical, practical understanding to be a foundation to the spiritual, because otherwise it's just new age wooey wooey and, and it doesn't have any grounding. And I think that's where uh, the new age has really gotten a bad rap, so to speak. But it's really true. So now with quantum physics, and, it's, it, and science is catching up, I think, to spirituality. With quantum physics, at least through the work of Einstein and his colleagues, Max Planck and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and, and, and others, um, you know, there's, there, there's an ability for us to say, wait a minute, this is just common sense. This is just common sense. And when it's common sense, why not really, why not really uh, honor yourself as being the creator of your reality? So the quote that I, I had a really difficult time picking a quote because there's so many quotes that I love. But the one that, that really struck me the first time I heard it was from Max Planck, who was uh, born in 1858 and died in 1947. And he was a colleague of Einstein's and, um, and others. And he was one of the fathers, really, of quantum physics. And he said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That is so very powerful. Um, 
So if you have uh, a glass half empty kind of an attitude, if you're worried about money, if you're stressed out about your health, if you're stressed in a stressful relationship and you're not happy, that is a program that's pretty much running you. It's a belief system that you have, so to speak, in your subconscious that is, that's like automatic. And it's very, very important for us, first of all, to become aware that we have these patterns. When we become aware that we have these patterns is the only time we can change them. Being aware of a negative pattern of thinking is 50% of shifting it. And then there are other modalities that are coming to the fore today, modalities that are really helping people make change in their lives, really helping people let go of these negative programs that keep sucking them back into this hole of uh, sabotaging their success and whatever it happens to look like. And that's really what I'm focused on in my life is to truly be present so that I can consciously create my reality. I call it being a deliberate creator of my reality. When I wake up every day, I want to create my day and I want to create my life. So that's really what I'm up to. I'm a scientist in my own life laboratory because I know that when I can change my mind, um, about the way I look at things. When I can change my mind about the way I look at my life, my life is going to change because who is the artist of my life? I am. My life is my canvas. I am the artist. I am painting it. No one has the right to come and paint my canvas, nor do I have the right to paint anyone else's. So if we just understood that and understand the power that we have collect individually first to create fabulous lives. Then we can come together and solve these problems. You know, there's no hard and fast solution to a new economy. You know, it has to begin somewhere. So I think it really begins with being deliberate creators. So that's my quantum quote. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Try it. Your life will change. So we are coming to the close of our show. And I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the wonderful sponsors that have come forth for Get Conscious Now. I'm very grateful. Uh, one of our very first sponsors is a restaurant in town that's fairly new. It's called State and Fig, and it's owned by Marissa and Patrick Moran, who were very successful uh, uh, restaurateurs in LA, and it was always their dream to move to Santa Barbara to open a restaurant. So they redid this deli on, in La Arcada right on Figueroa and State. And the restaurant is really wonderful. I had my birthday party there this year, and we got along so well with the servers and everyone that I asked if they would sponsor our show. And there wasn't even a question. It was just yes. And what they do is they bring this array of every sandwich you can think of and homemade chips and drinks and salads for our meeting at 1 o'clock um, every Saturday when we do the show. And our second sponsor is Twyla Kim, who is a fabulous hairstylist, and she works for Sequel Salon. And she is really a, a wonderful addition to our team. So thank you very much tonight for joining us. If it's, maybe it's going to be during the day when you watch the show. Forgive me. But Stu, thank you for being a wonderful co-host. And Eileen, thank you so much for joining thank you. us. Thank yeah. Love you, Patricia. Yeah. Hello, I'm Twyla Kim. I've been an artist and hairstylist in Santa Barbara for 20 years. I personalize color, design, and precision haircuts for each individual at Sequel Salon in Montecito. Welcome to State and Fig, located in the picturesque Guaracata Plaza, serving locally sourced cuisine inspired by the flavors of the Riviera. 